I would want us to take it easy and uh, just learn a few words that are going to be very common, commonly used and uh, words that we need to be conversant with uh, so that uh, we are on the same page. And I'll start by a brief uh, definition of biotechnology. Uh, so biotechnology uh, comes from two big words, the bio and the technology. And uh, it is a technology that exploits the bio, the living form of nature for purposes of economic value. And uh, when we talk about biotechnology, you find solutions for a number of uh, constraints in the health sector, food security, energy, and environment. So almost all uh, sectors of our economy, there is some application of biotechnology. And uh, I'm going to use an opportunity to demonstrate to you that biotechnology is more than just GMOs. It is in our everyday uh, activities. Now, uh, when we define uh, biotechnology, the very, very old technology is the technology of fermentation, which everybody in this room has experienced or has known somebody who, exper or who has experienced the use of the product of fermentation, which is uh, alcohol. It is the oldest science. Uh, ab about two weeks ago, I was talking about it, and they say that it is as old as the human civilization, although it was the f first recorded by the Egyptian civilization about 5000 BC. So fermentation as a technology, the technology of uh, utilizing uh, uh, alcohol, uh, yeast to ferment starch is very old. And even in our cultures, any culture in, in Kenya, uh, there's an experience there is uh, something that our traditional uh, grandparents used to develop alcohol and it was consumed. Now we moved on from that traditional one to the conventional biotechnologies, including the tissue culture. Yesterday we were discussing about what people know about tissue culture and I was really happy that many of us are aware of tissue culture, especially from the efforts that have been made uh, with the tissue culture banana. It is not GMO, it is a technology that uh, gets uh, uh, to use disease-free uh, planting material. Now moving on, of course, we get to the now GMOs, as we know it, genetically modified organisms, uh, uh, which, of course, is the topic, the current topic that we are having today. But other technologies have come on board and we have a chance to talk about them, the genome editing and uh, all the gene drives. Uh, so basically, the traditional, the conventional uh, biotechnologies, no controversies, but when you come to GMOs, they are all kinds of issues and that's a part of the reason why we brought all of you together. Now to understand the the genesis of biotechnology, I would, like you, I would like to take you back to a biology 101 again, uh, which starts from what uh, the DNA is. Uh, DNA, which is the building block of uh, all organisms, whether you are talking about insects, plants, or animal, the DNA is all the same. Uh, the composition of DNA has the same alphabet, and the alphabet in the DNA of any organism is ACTG. Our alphabet, uh, uh, writing our alphabet are 26 letters. In the DNA, we only have those four letters, and it is the interchange of these letters that define all organisms. Now, earlier on, when we were talking about uh, biotechnology, we used to do a very simple experiment with my friend, Professor Ngu, to demonstrate that you can isolate DNA from any organism, very simple, and a number of you probably who are old enough 
uh, uh, been able to do that experiment. So, um, so there's that universality and uh, how the DNA works. Sorry, I'm wondering whether I've been to change some of my slides. How the DNA works is very simple. You so the within our system when we talk about the origin of the DNA as the building blocks, within each and every one of us of any of these organisms, we have cells, and within the cells we have the nucleus, and within the nucleus we have what is called chromosomes, and within the chromosomes we have uh, uh, basically segments of those chromosomes, and segments of those chromosomes is what defines the various traits. So you can define a gene as a portion of your DNA that will define a trait. So depending on the combinations that we have the, the, of the, the alphabet, you will have different traits, uh, different uh, characteristics uh, that defines whether a plant has a disease resistance, whether we have uh, in, uh, we have, uh, you know, drought resistance traits. So basically, it is those traits that are utilized during the modification of, uh, of DNA modifications. Now, so when we talk about the DNA modifications, the starting point is being able to allocate or to identify a section of the DNA that is able to define a particular trait that you are interested in. So if you are interested in disease resistance, you'll be able to locate that sequence of DNA. And what this technology has done is then to allow you to remove that portion of the DNA sequence, transfer it to your organism of interest, and then you will be able to bring the trait that you are interested in, uh, whether it is disease resistance, whether it is insect resistance, you will be able to bring it on board. Now, there are tools that are used. I'm using a typical example of uh, insulin. Now, many of us know insulin as a, a drug that is used by uh, many of our relatives who are diabetic. And in the medical field, where all this modification started, a gene for insulin was isolated, and once it was isolated, it was transferred to uh, what is called a vehicle, and then brought to a bacteria. And of course, once it was introduced into the bacteria, the bacteria then is able to multiply it. So the bacteria acts as a factory to grow the insulin, which can then be packaged and used by those who need it. So you start with a DNA of interest, introduce it, and then you use the bacteria. This is in the medical field. Now, when you come to the technology that we talk about, uh, for example, the introduction of BT into our crops. Again, you need to identify your gene of interest. You then bring it on board, introduce it to the plant, and it will have the desired effect. So the starting point for the long story, something that the scientists do, is to identify your gene of interest, bring it on board, and then you will be able to generate what is called BT maize and BT cotton. Now, BT maize or BT cotton are products that are resistant to insect infestation, whether you're talking about if it is BT cotton, ballworm is the target. If it is BT maize, the target is this maize stock borers. So the possibility of transferring genes is possible because we all have 
DNA in our systems. All organisms have DNA and the DNA alphabet is the same across the board. And because of the similarity in the alphabet, it's possible to derive the, the gene, or let's call it the trait of interest from a bacteria. In this particular case, it is derived from a bacteria. It is introduced into the maize or the cotton, and the cotton that results will be able to uh, express that particular protein, and you will be uh, able to understand how, uh, I mean, to resist uh, the insect infestation. So uh, biotechnology has applications in all those spheres, and uh, uh, one advantage is the insulin that I've talked about. Now, when it now comes to the actual process of uh, developing the GMO uh, product, of course, it starts from the laboratory phase where the proof of concept is being developed and the transfers are taking place. And that's how institutions like Calro gets involved. They're able to develop the product and take it through the greenhouse, uh, the CFTs, and finally have an environmental release uh, as the final stage. So it's a, a long process. Even the discovery of the gene itself, the gene of interest, then introducing it and eventually doing the tests, which starts from the laboratory to greenhouse, greenhouse to the confined field trials, and eventually uh, the environmental release, uh, which, of course, we will talk about uh, in detail. Uh, the ultimate stage is where you are now generating the final product that can be introduced uh, into uh, the field. So uh, technically, it is the transfer of the trait to your parental organism that defines what GMOs is all about. And you, you transfer the trait because it has its economic value, and then you do the testing to ensure safety. Of course, before the final product is released, all manner of uh, assessments are done from food and feed safety, environmental safety, to, uh, of course, socioeconomic considerations and variety releases, uh, which is then uh, undertaken by CAFIS uh, as uh, the organization that is in charge. Now, when it comes to uh, Kenya, so we're talking about commercialization. Uh, but uh, in Kenya today, the only product that you have on the ground is BT cotton. And BT cotton uh, approval came about from a cabinet decision back in 2019. And of course, NBA then really gave out the approval for actual commercialization. And uh, the planting has gone on since 2020, and it is continuing. Now, the BT maize, uh, which generated a lot of discussion, its commercialization also began after a cabinet decision in 2022. I'm sure uh, the NBA team will be able to give us an update on where we are with the BT maize. But BT cotton is already in the field, and many of you who have been in this space long enough have visited a number of field stations, have been able to join uh, uh, some of your colleagues while I, I was at NBA and when I hear a number of journalists saying that we need to do field visits I think it is timely because with the field visits you also demystify what uh, GMOs are all about. Now I would like to uh, just briefly cover the, the global status and when you talk about sources of information AISA is a very important organization uh, for the longest time, they've been summarizing the status of GMO adoption in the country. And the last report was 2018. And as per that report, up to 70 countries had adopted biotech crops, uh, with 26 countries uh, uh, already, uh, 26 countries, uh, 21 in developing countries, and five in industrial countries 
planting up to 191.7 million hectares. And in the in Africa, of course, Nigeria has been leading, but in addition to that, this slide also needs an update. We have South Africa, Sudan, and Kenya, which joined shortly after that report was re prepared. And this is an, an explanation on how the trends have been since the first commercialization in 1996. The acreage has increased over the years, and uh, it's important to note how there is indeed uh, uh, an increase in participation of the uh, developing countries as the saturation in the developed world takes place. Now, the leading crops, as far as GMO adoption is, includes the soya bean at 78%, cotton at 76%, maize at 30%, and canola at 29%. These are the global adoption rates as of 2018. Uh, soya bean leads, uh, cotton comes close second, and of course maize is at 30%. I think it's important to say that when we talk about adoption of uh, GMOs in the global arena, when you talk about cotton, it doesn't mean it is one uh, G GM product. There are several products that have been developed. Ours is a BT cotton, but there are countries that have herbicide tolerant, others have mixed products. So it is not one product. Even for maize, or even when you talk about beet maize, it's not one product. It depends on what trait you've been able to confer. Within the African sphere, again, uh, it includes uh, Sudan, Kenya, Eswatini, and we are happy to be a part of this global arena.